tonight on a very special New Year's edition of the Rosenberg Report. It was a crazy, chaotic year, marked by war, rumors of war, revolution, and political upheaval with potentially prophetic implications. So what were the biggest stories affecting Israel, the Arab Muslim world, and the church in 2022? Who were the biggest drivers of change for evil and for good? Get ready to count down the 10 biggest headlines of the year, tonight on The Rosenberg Report. Good evening from Jerusalem and welcome to The Rosenberg Report. Wow, what an incredible year it's been. Together with my producers from the Rosenberg Report, and of course, the senior staff of All Israel News and All Arab News, we've been sifting through hundreds of interesting headlines that we've done this year to come up with the top 10 biggest, most important, most talked about, and most read stories affecting Israel in 2022. So let the countdown begin. Coming in at number 10, Elon Musk rises as a global champion of free speech. On April 14th, Musk announced his intention to buy the social media giant Twitter. Given how much Israelis love social media, this was a huge story here. And All Israel News soon published a column by my son Jacob with this headline. Why is the left freaked out about Elon Musk buying Twitter for $44 billion? because it hates free speech. Musk is a tech billionaire who calls himself a free speech absolutist, Jacob noted. He believes that tech platforms should abide by the principles of the First Amendment of the US Constitution. And he's acted upon this belief by his recent purchase of Twitter. While many view Musk's acquisition as a welcome relief from big tech censorship, many others are terrified. Why? because our ruling class is obsessed with maintaining control of publicly accepted narratives, Jacob wrote. The most prominent example he gave was its overstep of Twitter's banning of the former president of the United States, Donald Trump. Twitter has also repeatedly censored stories, many of which were later proven to be accurate because they challenged establishment narratives. This included censorship of the New York Post scoop on Hunter Biden's laptop. Musk's apparent tipping point, Jacob noted, was when Twitter suspended the Babylon Bee, a Christian satire site, after it satirically declared that the U.S. Assistant Secretary for Health, Rachel Levine, a man who self-identifies as a woman, its first annual Man of the Year, following the USA Today's naming of Levine as one of its Women of the Year. Now, this fall, Musk when he took over the company finally, began releasing internal documents, the Twitter files, proving Twitter's deliberate efforts to elect Democrats and silence conservatives. As Musk recently quipped, he didn't just buy a company, he bought a crime scene. That's a story we'll be watching closely in 2023. Coming in at number nine, Turkish President Recep Erdogan restores diplomatic ties with Israel after more than a decade of hostile relations. All Israel News senior correspondent Tal Heinrich, who also is our producer at the Rosenberg Report, she reported this story for us in August. The following month, Erdogan told Jewish leaders he wants to visit Israel soon. But throughout the year, I warned readers not to trust Erdogan. Not now, not ever, I wrote. The man is a wolf in wolf's clothing. In my book, Enemies and Allies, I profiled Erdogan at some length and explained who he really is. Here's the short version. Step by step, I wrote, Erdogan, who is a radical Islamist, is becoming allies with Russian President Vladimir Putin and Iran's Supreme Leader, the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei and his inner circle. As a former CIA director told me, he sees this alliance between Russia Iran and Turkey as an unholy alliance. I couldn't agree more, especially as Erdogan prepares to send Turkish military forces into Syria, just north of Israel, early in 2023. Coming in at number eight, 
Israel uncovers one incredible archaeological discovery after another. Now, when Lynn and I were first married, we went to a church near Washington, D.C., where the pastor loved to say, the more they dig out of the ground in Israel, the more they prove the Bible is true. Amen. In March, All Israel News reported that archaeologists have found an ancient tablet containing not only the oldest Hebrew text ever written in Israel, but the oldest Hebrew text that mentions Jehovah, the very name of God. Five days later, we reported the announcement that archaeologists have discovered the oldest church in all of Israel, dating back to the third century AD. They've even found a mosaic inside the church containing the oldest known inscription in the history of Israel, declaring that Jesus is both Messiah and God. The inscription, written in ancient Greek, dedicates the church to the God, Jesus Christ. Remarkably, the church was discovered underneath an Israeli prison located across the street from, wait for it, Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo, known in the book of Revelation as Armageddon. Now, Israeli authorities say they're planning to move the prison and turn the ancient Christian church into a major tourist attraction. And then, just days ago, we reported that Israeli archaeologists have deciphered inscriptions on stone tablets found right here in Jerusalem that support the biblical account that there really was an Israelite king in the 8th century before Christ named Hezekiah. Says the professor in charge of the archaeological team, the discovery strengthens the approach of researchers who emphasize the reliability of the Bible. Coming in at number seven, the U.S. Supreme Court overturns the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision, declaring that the abortion of an unborn baby is not a constitutional right. The decision was hotly debated around the world, including right here in Israel. As I explained in a column, most Jews see abortion not only as a right, but as a Jewish value. According to Pew, 83% of American Jews believe abortion should be legal in all or most cases. Israel's government made abortion legal in 1977, four years after the United States, and most Israelis today strongly support abortion on demand. But let's be clear, the Hebrew Bible, the very foundation of the Jewish faith, teaches that the, at the moment of conception, a new human life is formed, made in the image of God and worthy of protection. The first conception of a child is described in the fourth chapter of Genesis. Now, Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. In Psalm 139, King David thanks God and does it quite eloquently for the sanctity of unborn human life. For you, Lord, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Sadly, few Jews read or believe their own scriptures today. So please pray for my people to rediscover God's word and to come to value innocent human life from conception to natural death. Coming up next on the Rosenberg Report, can you guess the biggest stories of the year in Israel and the Arab Muslim world? Which ones made it to the top of Joel's list? We'll find out after the break. Welcome back as we continue our countdown of the biggest stories affecting Israel in 2022. Now coming in at number six, anti-Semitism hits record highs in the United States. We'll soon have hard numbers for 2022, but anti-Semitic incidents reached an all-time high in the United States in 2021, according to the Anti-Defamation League. And tragically, we've seen them continue to spike this year. Compounding the problem, Former President Donald Trump met in November at Mar-a-Lago with two men seething with hatred towards Jews. One was rapper Kanye West, who goes by Ye, and the second was Nick Fuentes, a white supremacist and Holocaust denier. 
In a column for All Israel News, I urged Trump to apologize and to unequivocally denounce both West and Fuentes. To my surprise, the column was quoted on Fox News Sunday. Take a listen. One of the things in the Trump-Pence administration I know that you all were very proud of was the support of Israel. I was there in Jerusalem. We talked there when you all were moving the embassy, the Abraham Accords. There's been great support um, for Israel from the Trump-Pence administration. And yet the president is now making a lot of headlines for having a couple of people at Mar-a-Lago who've made anti-Semitic remarks. One of them is a Holocaust denier. Um, Joel Rosenberg writes over at All Israel News, this headline, Trump's terrible mistake. Dining with two anti-Semites last week was an un mitigated disaster and tarnishes his otherwise stellar record as being pro-Israel and pro-Jewish. Um, the president made some statements about not knowing exactly who Nick Fuentes was or others there. Is that in itself disqualifying this whole episode? Bibi Netanyahu's called him out for somebody who is running to be the president again of this country. Well, I think that's a question for the American people. But you know, anti-Semitism is real. And it's rising in many parts of the world. You know, as I write in my book, I had the privilege of co-founding the Anti-Semitism Caucus on Capitol Hill with the late Tom Lantos, who was the only Holocaust survivor ever to serve in the Congress of the United States. And I think it's important for those of us who've had the opportunity to serve our country or aspire to serve our country in high national office to make it clear that there is no place in the American political debate uh, for white nationalism, for um, Holocaust deniers, or for anti-Semitism. I think I, I made it clear that the president was wrong uh, to give uh, the anti-Semit, you know, anti-Semites a seat at the table. It was wrong for President Barack Obama to associate with Louis Farrakhan. I think now more than ever, uh, we need to make it clear uh, that we reject anti-Semitism. Uh, left, right, and center leaders in this country deserve and uh, to speak those words to the American people. Coming in at number five, a new and rapidly expanding revolution is underway in Iran. On September 13th, Iranian police arrested and beat to death a 22-year-old woman named Masa Amini. Why? Because they said she wasn't wearing her headscarf properly. Amini's murder triggered a nationwide demand for regime change. Too much of the mainstream media is ignoring or downplaying the magnitude of this story. But we've been tracking it closely since it's the most significant grassroots uprising since the Iranian Revolution of 1979. More than 500 protesters have been murdered by the government. Nearly 20,000 protesters have been arrested so far. Persecution of Iranian Christians is spiking, and there seems to be no end in sight. And now, a dramatic new twist. As we reported on All Arab News, a niece of Iran's supreme leader is now urging world leaders to sever all ties with Tehran. In a video released on YouTube, she says her country is covered in darkness and ruled by demonic and evil forces. هر روزه در جای جای جهان شاهد رنج انسان ها و قتل و جنایت رو به گسترش بوده و هستیم. Please pray for the Lord to save the leaders of Iran or remove them and fast and pray for the people of Iran. Coming in at number four, one million Jewish people worldwide now believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, when I was born in 1967, there were barely 2,000 Jews on the entire planet Earth who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus whom we call Yeshua in Hebrew. Yet, as we unpacked at length on our entire Thanksgiving episode of the Rosenberg Report, there are now truly upwards of one million people of Jewish descent who are followers of Jesus, including 871,000 in the United States alone. This is more than at any other time in human history, as we noted in a companion story on All Israel News. Now, too few in the media, even the Christian media, have given attention to this important story. But that's exactly why I launched the Rosenberg Report, All Israel News, and All Arab News, to tell you the news that the mainstream media won't. Now, coming in at number three, five red heifers have arrived in Israel, raising the question, are the third temple and the Messiah coming soon? 
Nicole Jansien, our senior correspondent and news editor for All Israel News, broke the story for us in September. As she noted in her story, when five perfect red heifers touched down in Israel, their presence in the land triggered a whirlwind of speculation as to their prophetic significance and whether we are barreling towards the building of the third temple, followed by the tribulation and the second coming of Christ. Quote, the five red heifers belonging to a rancher in Comanche, Texas, were gathered and flown here to Israel thanks to the efforts of a Christian organization, Bonet Israel. What's more, Nicole reported, these cows may be ready for sacrifice in Jerusalem as early as August or September in 2023, but only if they remain red and unblemished, thus confirming that they are indeed ritually pure. Coming up next on the Rosenberg Report, can you guess the biggest stories of the year in Israel and the Arab Muslim world? Which ones made it to the top of Joel's list? We'll find out after the break. And welcome back to a special New Year's edition of the Rosenberg Report as we unveil the two biggest stories affecting Israel in 2022. Coming in at number two, Vladimir Putin invades Ukraine, triggering widespread speculation that the prophetic war of Gog and Magog could happen soon. Nearly a year before it happened, in April 2021, my colleagues and I at All Israel News began sounding the alarm that an invasion of Ukraine was increasingly likely. Month after month, we covered Putin's buildup of forces on Ukraine's borders. We explained what Putin was doing and why. We urged Christians to wake up to the disaster ahead and to pray without ceasing that God would stop this countdown to catastrophe. Few believed us, but on February 24th, 2022, Putin launched the biggest land war in Europe since World War II. Now we've covered the war every step of the way, including the surge in speculation that the war could be a prelude to the War of Gog and Magog described in the Bible. In my columns on my Joshua Run podcast, Inside the Epicenter, in numerous media interviews, and on the very first episode of the Rosenberg Report, I've considered this question from multiple angles. The short version is this. It's too early to say whether Vladimir Putin is Gog. But is Putin Gog-esque, an evil dictator building a military and political alliance with Iran, Turkey, and other nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39? Yes. Have Putin and other senior Russian officials publicly denounced and threatened Israel in an unprecedented way in 2022? Yes. In May, Russia's foreign minister said the worst anti-Semites are Jews. In October, a top advisor to Putin warned that Moscow is ready to cut off all bilateral relations with Israel if Israel supplies weapons to Ukraine. A poll commissioned by the Joshua Fund and reported on All Israel News finds that 40% of all Americans, all Americans, believe that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a sign of biblical prophecy coming to pass and a sign of the last days. 40%, that's 103 million Americans. This includes 70% of American evangelicals, as you might expect, but it also includes 28% of American Jews and 35% of all Democrats. That said, I've repeatedly cautioned people not to jump to conclusions. Ezekiel foretells a Russian invasion of Israel, not Ukraine. And 10 months into the Ukraine war, Russia is losing badly. U.S. officials say that well over 100,000 Russian troops have been killed or wounded in the last 10 months. If Putin loses in Ukraine, the chances of a coup or an assassination attempt against him go up, and the chances that Putin is the biblical Gog go down. That said, I've also repeatedly warned, here on TBN and elsewhere, that the more humiliated Putin becomes, the greater the chance that he might resort to using nuclear weapons. That's why this remains a huge story and one that we need to keep a very close eye on as we head into 2023. 
And now, drum roll please, coming in as the number one most important story, the biggest story of the year affecting Israel in 2022, Benjamin Bibi Netanyahu mounts dramatic comeback, returns as the Jewish state's longest serving prime minister. On May 1st, I wrote a column based on an hour long meeting I had with Bibi, calling him tanned, rested and ready for a political comeback. In July, I argued that Bibi had a 60% chance of returning as prime minister. Throughout the summer and fall, we closely covered his campaign and all the other campaigns too. And in October, on the very first episode of the Rosenberg Report, we profiled Netanyahu in a story we called Comeback Kid or Bye Bye Bibi. I wrote at the time, I told you, Bibi is a shrewd political cat and it's by no means clear that his nine lives are up. I told you to prepare for the likelihood that the longest serving premier in modern Israeli history was about to return to power. And sure enough, Netanyahu not only won his elections decisively, but this week he made history by forming yet another government, making him the only Israeli prime minister ever to come back from the political wilderness, not just once, but twice. Now I commend to you highly Netanyahu's fascinating new memoir, Bibi, My Story. I reviewed it last month and named it All Israel News Book Club Pick of the Month. It's even more important now for evangelicals to read it now that he's back in power, now that he's trying to manage a highly controversial new cabinet, and now that he's pursuing his top three agenda items. Now, having read the book cover to cover, I believe it will shed some light on three critical questions. First, can Bibi continue his free market revolution, turbocharge economic growth here in Israel, restrain inflation, and help Israelis earn higher wages and buy more affordable apartments? Second, after making peace with four Arab countries, can Bibi now strike a peace deal with Saudi Arabia? And third, can Bibi truly neutralize the Iran nuclear threat with or without the help of the Biden administration even as Putin and the Iranians forge an ever closer alliance. One thing's for sure, even when the mainstream media ignores Israel and the broader Middle East, you can count on the Rosenberg Report and my colleagues at All Israel News and All Arab News to tell you what's happening in the epicenter, why it matters, and who and what to pray for. And let's be sure to start the new year by praying faithfully for Prime Minister Netanyahu, his family, and his team.